This video is one in a series of studies on the Gospel of Mark. In this video, we'll be covering the first half of the fifth chapter of Mark. As we work our way through it, take note how the same word or concept may, at times, be a good thing and, at other times, be a bad thing. So much depends on whether it is just a show or whether it is coming from deep in the heart. There can be a correct application of a truth and a wrong one. You'll see what I mean in a minute. The chapter starts out with Jesus encountering a man who is possessed by 2,000 demons. The guy could literally break chains. He was so supernaturally strong and out of control. He was naked and he lived like an animal in the graveyard outside of town. But when this demon-possessed man saw Jesus, the Bible says that he ran and worshipped Jesus. I don't want to make too much of this particular word worship because most of the modern translations just say that he fell on his knees before Jesus or something along those lines. But I do want to stress that there can be two types of worship. There can be genuine, heartfelt submission to God, or there can be just a show of worship, like falling on your knees. We need to recognize this second form of worship and stay away from it, because it's not really worship at all. Even the devil can perform that kind of worship. If we allow ourselves to be sucked in by false worship, we could end up as crazy as that madman even though the Bible says that he technically worshipped Jesus. This man, or more correctly, the demons inside this man, were certainly not worshipping Jesus in the correct sense, even though the King James Bible says that they worship Jesus. And I have to say that so much that passes for worship in churches these days is no more genuine than the behaviour of that demon-possessed madman. We fall on our knees, raise our hands in the air, cry and shout and carry on. But in the end, it's all just a show. Do you see what I'm saying? There is worship that is just a show. And then there is real worship, something that mostly happens in secret between you and God alone. In your prayer closet, like Jesus said. Take notice in the seventh verse that the demons even praised Jesus. They called him the Son of the Most High God. Isn't that impressive? And in the name of God, supposedly, they asked Jesus to do something for them. That too we see happening in churches all over the world, don't we? People shouting praises to God and then praying for God to do something for them. Selfish prayers, all centering around what they want. So, there is worship, and then there is true worship, and we need to learn to tell the difference. In the same way, there is praise, and then there is real praise. Jesus said, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, but then do not do the things which I tell you to do? But the praise and worship that we see most often is little more than demonic exhibitions of false piety. And we know that because whenever you try to talk to these people about obedience to the things that Jesus taught, everything changes. But, having said that, I wonder if you've ever noticed this. Jesus answered their prayer. The prayer of the demons. That's right, false worship. Selfish prayers and he still answered it. There is a saying about giving people enough rope so they can hang themselves. Well, that is just about literally what happened. The demons didn't want to go back to hell, and so they begged Jesus to send them into a huge herd of pigs instead. And Jesus did that. He sent 2,000 demons into 2,000 pigs. And what do you suppose happened next? The pigs ran off a cliff and drowned. And the demons still ended up in hell. In the process, of course, Jesus had rid the country of a business which had been forbidden in the law. The disobedient pig farmers lost their entire herd. What we see illustrated in this interaction between Jesus and 2,000 demons is that God often does give us what we ask for, even when we ask selfishly, but it does not satisfy our souls. When the children of Israel asked for meat in the wilderness, the Bible says that God gave them the desire of their hearts, but He sent leanness to their souls. And that is another perfect picture of the church world today. People are rolling in wealth, 
but starving to death spiritually. They ask for things they don't need and they don't know how to handle it when they get them until eventually both they and their unclean wealth fall off the cliff and into hell where they all belong. So what happened next in the story? The pig farmers ran and told the people in town about what happened and the town folk came racing out to the cemetery where the Bible says that they found the crazy man fully clothed and sitting quietly, quote, in his right mind. Here we have another contrast between the genuine and the counterfeit. There is crazy and then there is really crazy. This man had been certifiably crazy at the start of the story because of the demons that were inside him. But when he met Jesus, the craziness left him. And this is where we discover the absolute worst kind of crazy. The Bible says that when the people saw the man clothed and sitting in his right mind, they were afraid. You could understand them being afraid before, afraid of a madman who could break chains, but these guys were afraid of a man who had been totally transformed by the power of God. Or maybe they were just afraid of a man who could so totally change the crazy man. For the Bible says, they, the people from the town, began to pray Jesus to depart out of their coasts. Now that is crazy. And the world today, for all its wealth and respectability, reacts in much the same crazy way whenever we try to introduce them to the real Jesus of the Bible now. They ask us to leave. Take your gospel and spread it somewhere else, they say. Now notice this other religious word which appeared in this part of the story. It said in the King James Version that the townsfolk prayed Jesus to leave. Once again, more modern translations use words like asking, pleading and imploring. But considering who they were addressing, all those words are what praying means, aren't they? You ask, plead and implore God to do something for you. And what they wanted God to do was to get away from them. In one way or another, all our selfish prayers amount to the same thing. We want our way, on our terms, and we are not open to hearing anything else. Like the selfish prayers of those 2,000 devils before them, Jesus answered the selfish prayers of the respectable townsfolk. He got back into his ship and left. But before that, in verses 18 and 19, we see the man who had been healed also praying, and this guy is really praying. Ironically, he does not get his prayer answered, even though his prayer is far more genuine. That isn't how we usually hear it, is it? We usually assume that the person who gets what they ask for is the person who was asking correctly. This man was begging Jesus, pleading with him to let him leave in the ship with Jesus. But Jesus told him to go back into the city and to start preaching from day one. So there are prayers and then there are real prayers. And you don't spot the genuine prayers by who gets yes as an answer. A genuine prayer, you see, always ends the way Jesus prayed to his father. Nevertheless, your will be done. What both Jesus and this healed man wanted was the Father's will. And here is where I want to address a very serious lie that has been propagated by the false preachers of the world in connection with this story. They point to this same man, the devil-possessed man who was delivered, as proof that people don't have to leave everything and follow Jesus. Sure, Jesus said that we have to forsake all that we own if we want to be one of his disciples, but they say Jesus obviously didn't mean it because of this story. They say that Jesus sent the healed man back home. And this is touted as evidence that Jesus really wants most of us to get jobs and settle back into the system, doing everything we can to convince people that we are respectable. But is that what really happened in the story? More to the point, are these people who preach this excuse in any way similar to the healed demoniac? Oh, they may be controlled by the devil as he was at the start of the story. I can accept that similarity for sure. But if they had ever been delivered from their sorry state like he was, they would not be looking for an excuse not to follow Jesus. They would be, like this man, begging Jesus to let them forsake all and follow him. 
Notice where the healed man's heart was. Read it. When Jesus was coming to the ship, he that had been possessed with the devil prayed Jesus that he might be with him. You see, that man wanted nothing more than to become one of Jesus' disciples. He wanted it with his whole heart, and he did become a disciple of Jesus that day. Listen to it. Jesus said to him, Go home to your friends and tell them how great things the Lord has done for you and how he has had compassion on you. Do you see anywhere in those instructions where Jesus says, Get a job, raise a family, become a pillar in the community? No. This man had, in fact, actually been promoted, at least temporarily, above the other disciples. He was immediately given the same instruction that Jesus eventually gave to all his disciples before his ascension into heaven. You see, this guy had already forsaken all. He had already left his job. He had learned many of the most important spiritual lessons through what he had experienced at the hands of the devil. And now it was time for him to start preaching the good news of the kingdom of heaven. So Jesus sent him out immediately to do just that. The passage continues. He, the healed demoniac, departed and began to publish in Decapolis. Do you know what Decapolis means? It's ten cities. He didn't just go home and say, Hi mom, hi dad, I'm healed. Do you know where I can get a good paying job? He had a job and he faithfully carried it out. It says he began to publish in Decapolis how great things Jesus had done for him, and all men did marvel. All men, the entire population of those ten towns, heard the good news. Now listen to the next verse. And when Jesus was passed over again by ship unto the other side, much people gathered unto him. So stick that in your pipe and smoke it, all you preachers who want to use this story as an excuse to disobey Jesus. Yes, the demoniac was an exception, but only in that he was able to start preaching immediately. Although I wouldn't be surprised if he was allowed to hop in the boat with Jesus after Jesus arrived back in the area. And I can be pretty sure that he was one of the 120 in the upper room on the day of Pentecost. So, where does that leave you and me? How long are we going to just sit around reading the theory and not putting it into practice? There is worship, and then there is real worship. There are prayers, and then there are real prayers. There is crazy, and then there is real crazy. Where do you stand? Are you just going through the motions, or are you walking away from the things of the world and going into all the world to preach the gospel in unity with all true followers of Christ? Please write to me today if you would like to be put in contact with others who have been living this lifestyle for a few years now. We have a huge task ahead of us and we need all the help we can get. I look forward to hearing from you today. God bless you.